Today I'm joined to talk intersectionality and allyship today with Nilmini as I'll get her to introduce herself. Oh, thanks so much, Louisha. It's just wonderful to be able to have this conversation with you. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I, um, I'm a black feminist scholar um, and my area of, I suppose, what I've spent most of the time studying has been intersectionality. So I work um, at WIRE. I have worked for the last five years with WIRE, which is a women's organisation, and at the same time I do critical race work in an academic setting. So I call myself a practice-based scholar and educator. Yeah. Um, and the most of the work that I've been doing at WIRE over the last few years has been research and education on intersectionality itself, but very particularly how it's applied in financial capability um, with marginalised groups and, and women. What is intersectionality and why is it important in financial wellness services support and program development? Firstly, as a First Nations women and First Nations people in this country and in this world, we've got to acknowledge all that we have on our own experiences with discrimination and oppression. We must consider everything and anything that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women have faced before we can move on and before we can move forward. We all need to understand our history and redress the economic injustice that we face. We are now in the generation of people who are breaking intergenerational patterns of systemic oppression. To support our women, we must create a trauma-informed practice to achieve overall financial health and financial security and economic empowerment. It takes time, it takes commitment and consistency from all levels. And that's from, of course, um, it takes accountability from corporate and change in policies to best support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. I think, Larissa, that's such an articulate way to put it because what I find is that people re use intersectionality not to its full potential. They don't really engage with what it's really talking about, right? And one of the important things that you said is oppression, not just interpersonal discrimination. And, and so the way I address intersectionality is always bottom up and always looking at the structures, not the identities. So I find a lot of my problems, I suppose, that I try to fix in the sector or when I'm doing any kind of work I'm doing, it's about getting people to think about, it's not just about your identity, it's about how those identities make you vulnerable and make you a target for policies and structural oppressions. Um, so that's one of the really important things and I think that you know one of the key documents about intersectionality that was written says, and I really agree with that, people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, First Nations women are the ones who have experienced racism and all the interlocking oppressions as they emerged into this country. Hence if we work and follow the lead we will unravel all the different kinds of structural uh, damages that are caused for other others groups of women like migrant women, refugee women and faith-based communities that are the others. Um, so I think that's the, the root of the issue and I think it's wonderful that we're able to have this conversation and start from that point because there's I have a whole lot further to go. Yeah, definitely. And also just leading on to that, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are only vulnerable because of the systemic oppression that we've faced. Absolutely. So it's that's why that re-education, and, and so I always use critical when I say intersectional. It's not just like, you know, oh, everybody's got, you know, different kinds of oppressions or identities. Critical means you always think about who put them there, mm -hmm. who are the groups that are through the, the structures, through the category, categories, the visa categories, migration, race, gender, gender diversity, which are the categories that push people to spaces of vulnerability. They are made vulnerable. Yeah. And that is what's so important about a strength-based approach. It doesn't take that deficit view. Rather than that, we have to think that people aren't just born vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Women have a lot of agency um, and a lot of, you know, ideas and about how to take care of their lives. But when they start to do something, that is what I find 
um, blocks them, is all the structures and the obstacles that face them that push them into positions yeah. of marginality. Yeah, definitely. And also the self-limiting beliefs that are, you know, put upon our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, um, you know, from corporate level, government and other community organisations. So how can we empower our women through an intersectionality and approaches as well that will work best for them? Mm. Yeah, I think that, you know, like I said, I mean, I suppose I'm a bit geeky with my intersectional knowledge, but what the, a lot of people don't realise, it is about a way to find and identify and see your agency and your strength, but at the same time be able to see how you've been made, been made vulnerable. Yeah. That is a really big aha moment for a lot of the women um, that I encounter and work with when they realise otherwise they think it's because I have a fault. It's because there's something wrong with me. And then you've got like all those gender stereotypes. Mm -hmm. You've got those race stereotypes. You've got those class stereotypes. Mm -hmm. All of them are like the social aspect mm -hmm. um, that keep people in that place. Mm -hmm. So we have to like work at the cultural level, but also I think really strongly work at the political and the policy level to shift that thinking. Thank you.